My name is Lee Vandervelt, and I wrote a book called Mrs. Dred Scott. I wrote the book because I discovered something that I had never known, and I don't think very many people had ever focused on. And that was that the most notorious case in American Supreme Court history was not about a single guy. It wasn't about Dred Scott, it was about a family. And the family had been overlooked as part of the motivations for the case that came before the United States Supreme Court. I came to the conclusion, after I'd done a lot of research, that it only made sense to understand this famous case if you focused on the family. The key player in the family turned out to be Harriet, Mrs. Dred Scott. And that's the reason that the title was given to the book. The remarkable thing about the Dred Scott story is that this is a case that split the United States in two. It created such a deep fracture in American society, in American ideology, that it could never really be healed again through conventional means. That's one of the things that the Supreme Court did. It was attempting to make a decision lasting, but instead what it did is it made a fracture lasting. The case of Dred Scott was the most notorious, and yet in denying Dred Scott his freedom, it was seen to represent four million slaves the vast majority of which lived in southern states. Not so for Dred and Harriet. They lived in Minnesota. What a difference then to consider a case that was brought by two adults and two children who had lived in Minnesota, who had lived in the free state of Minnesota before it was a state and they used that as the basis for bringing their suit before the United States Supreme Court. I think one of the interesting things about this is that coming from the upper north myself, I could never understand or imagine what it meant to be a slave in Minnesota. What did that mean? Everything that I had been led to believe was that no one was a slave in the Northwest. Not in Wisconsin, not in Minnesota, not in Illinois, not in Indiana, and that there had never been slavery in any of those places. So what did it mean that there was not just one dread, but there was also his wife? And once I began to scratch the surface, I discovered that there were at least a dozen slaves held at Fort Snelling over various times and always in slavery. How did they live? What did they do? They certainly couldn't raise cotton. What were they doing? Well, it turns out that what they were doing was performing the same domestic chores that anyone in a family would. And these domestic chores were necessary because of the nature of the wilderness frontier. You could only get provisions to the wilderness frontier about four months of the year. The rest of the time, you either had ice flows, or you had periodic freezes, or you had harbors that were frozen so tight that the only way you could make it into Fort Snelling was by snowshoe from Prairie to Sheen more than 200 miles away. It's a hard way to get your provisions into a fort where you're trying to last the winter. So one of the solutions was to bring in slaves for those who could afford it. Slaves could make life on the frontier just that much easier by doing the wood chopping, by doing the laundry, by preparing the food, which of course had to come from raw materials that were found locally, from wild game, from um, all kinds of combinations of canned and barreled pork, and from what little flour could be made into some kind of hominy or corn 
or drippings or the things that would take hours and hours to provide in order to be edible. This kind of work would totally absorb a person who was living on their own. It would totally absorb people who were trying to establish a state, people who were trying to establish a beachhead for national expansion, people who were collecting furs from the Native Americans to ship south and later to Europe for the fur trade, particularly the American Fur Company. So what they needed is they needed domestic help, and that's what the slaves provided. So the slaves in Minnesota were different than the slaves in the South. The slaves in Minnesota were domestic servants. They weren't in production of basic materials. They didn't weave, they didn't spin, they didn't um, grow, they didn't plant, they didn't harvest. What they did is they made the beds, they emptied the chamber pots, they made the food, they ironed, they did the laundry. And from time to time they curried the horses and did the things that the people who were officers, the people who were head men, couldn't do for themselves. Another thing that the Scots did in Minnesota is that they provided a cushion for officers to bring their wives. The worst thing would be to bring a wife, particularly a wife of some standing, to the frontier and expect her to do all this hard labor. Why, back in the cities that they came from, they could hire people to do this work. In the South, they could buy slaves to do this work. So if an officer's lady was going to be brought to the frontier, she needed that cushion of domestic service. She needed people who would do the housework for her because the housework was heavy going. It was heavy, heavy work. One of the surprises in doing research on Dredd and Harriet were how flat the facts of the case were when they were reported to the United States Supreme Court. By the time that that case got to the United States Supreme Court, there had been so many lawyers who had reduced the facts to what was simply a skeleton of the real lives that they had lived. So the facts that were stipulated in the case were based on a very narrow issue indeed, when the circumstances on which Dredd and Harriet were suing were much, much broader. The case came to the United States Supreme Court after 11 years of litigation. 11 years, the Scots were in limbo. All that time they spent in St. Louis, Dredd getting what work he could, and Harriet and her daughters doing laundry for pay. That's how they supported themselves. They were hired out, and whatever monies they could earn would be paid to whoever they were hired out to. In the course of this case, the issue narrowed from Harriet's, which was a better winning case, to Dred's, which was much narrower. Dredd had been brought to Minnesota by John Emerson. He'd been brought to Minnesota from another place in free territory, which was Fort Armstrong in Illinois. When the frontier moved west, Fort Armstrong wasn't needed anymore. So the entire infantry stationed at Fort Armstrong and their doctor were transferred up to Fort Snelling. Dredd went up to Fort Snelling along with his master, the doctor, and in the company of other slaves who were serving other officers, now being transferred to Fort Snelling because Fort Armstrong was being decommissioned. With the placement of a new infantry in Fort Snelling, Dredd did much as he did at Fort Armstrong. He probably took care of Dr. Emerson's horse. Dr. Emerson liked horses and he liked fast horses. And he frequently had more than one horse 
And instead of currying the horse himself, it was probably Dredd who did it. Dredd probably cooked for Dr. Emerson and clearly cleaned up his chambers. Dredd had been purchased again in the slave market in St. Louis. And when he came to Fort Snelling, there was already a young girl, slave, Harriet, owned, if she could be owned in free territory, by Major Lawrence Tolliver. It's spelled Taliaferro, but it's pronounced Tolliver. Well, Harriet was in the company of several slaves, and she was the slave of the Indian agent. When you think about Fort Snelling, it's important to make the distinction of those who lived within the thick stone walls and those who lived outside. Dredd lived within because he was part of the army. He was the army doctor's slave. Harriet lived outside in a house that was a quarter mile away without any fence, Later, a fence was built simply to keep the cattle out, but certainly without any wall, nothing protective. And it had to be such because the Indian agent's house was where the Indians came, and the Indian agent could expect them at almost all times of day or night. So there couldn't be a sentry keeping them away. He had to be in almost continuous contact, whether he liked it or not, with the native peoples to whom he was the ambassador. He was the delegate. He was the agent representing the United States government to the Dakota nation. So, Dredd and Harriet met, and within 18 months, they were married. It was sort of a December-May wedding because Dredd was on in years. He'd been married once before, before he was sold to Dr. Emerson. Harriet was young, had never been married before. But, Dr. but Major Tolliver, I'm going to start that sentence again. Sure. Major Tolliver was leaving for the winter. And he wasn't going to take Harriet with him. He was going to leave her there. And the way to leave her there was to leave her married to somebody who was going to be within the protection of the fort's walls. That way, she wouldn't be alone in the house. That way, she would make sure to be fed along with the rest of the slaves who served the army officers. That way, she would have a place within the fort. So, in his own words, he says he married Harriet to Dredd, and Dredd was delighted to have this nice, fine young woman as his wife. We don't know what Harriet thought. But the amazing thing about the Scots is that the foundation of their marriage in Minnesota stayed with them for the rest of their lives. Neither one ran from their masters. They always came back to each other. And so the bond that was formed between the two of them was one that extended to the death of dread. When Dredd and Harriet sued for their freedom, they were one of, on, of at least 300 slaves who had sued for freedom in the St. Louis courts before. The majority of them won. And the majority of them won on one particular basis, not because they had been promised freedom in their master's will, not because they had ever been formally manumitted, but because they, like the Scots, had lived in free territory. Free territory was anything north and west of the Ohio River, which is all of the states of the upper Midwest. So almost 300 slaves sued in St. Louis before Dredd and Harriet did. And Dredd and Harriet were bringing a fairly conventional, nothing surprising about this case, shouldn't have raised any eyebrows, lawsuit to establish as had been brought 300 times before that they were free because they had lived in free territory. Dredd had lived in Illinois, 
Herod and Dreaded both lived in free territory north of the Missouri Compromise. And by this time they had a daughter who, interestingly enough, was born on a steamboat in the middle of the Mississippi River, north of the important line. So the three of them had very good bases for claiming their freedom, and it should have been a slam dunk, easy, not a page turner case. They should have won. If a slave had lived in free territory, the presence of that slave in free territory, the presence of enslavement in free territory, broke the bonds that that slave would have otherwise held to his master. And in so doing, it rendered the slave free forever. To take a lawsuit to St. Louis was simply to redeem something that had already legally happened. By doing work in free territory, by residing in free territory, they had broken the basic abolition that the Northwest Ordinance and the Missouri Compromise provided, that slavery shall not exist in those northern lands. So, when Herod and Dredd brought their lawsuit, they did so shortly after Dredd returned from Texas. He had been taken off to Texas as part of what was going to be the Mexican-American War. Harriet and their two babies had remained behind. Dredd returned to her. He didn't run. He didn't make for Canada. He returned to Harriet. And within a matter of weeks of his return, the four of them filed for freedom. Two separate suits, Harriet and Dredd, each separately. Now, the, um, I'm just going to repeat a little bit what I've said in a little bit different terminology. <clears throat> the legal basis for the Dred Scott suit was that Dred and Harriet had lived and worked and resided in free territory. That was the legal basis. And under a statute in Missouri, they were entitled to file for their freedom and to redeem it, to have the court declare them fully and finally free from anyone who might claim them. Dredd and Harriet had some difficulty getting to a final judgment of the jury. The problems that they had were that by the time their case went to trial, they were owned by two people with relatively weak ties to them. Major Tolliver had given up Harriet. He had given her to dread. So Harriet did not seem to have any kind of master at all. She was in a very good position to conclude that she was a free woman, whether she was married to Dredd or not. Dredd was now the property of Dr. Emerson's widow who herself was in the process of moving to Massachusetts. In filing the lawsuit the first time, Herod and Dredd picked the wrong defendants because even though they didn't have clear masters, they had been hired out to somebody. So they filed suit against the Russells who they had been hired out to. The case fell apart at trial. The case lagged Langered, <laughs> wrong word. The case languished on, and it was another two years before it came back to trial. And by this time, there had been two enormous cataclysms in the city of St. Louis. There was an outbreak of cholera that killed almost 10% of the population. This is why Herod and Dredd are forbade from leaving the city limits. The second cataclysm was an enormous fire. 
that burned every steamboat in the harbor and spread to the town, engulfing the warehouses and the first four blocks of a city that really only extended eight blocks from the shoreline. Needless to say, the court case did not progress as expected in the year 1849. But in the year 1850, they were declared free, and they had very good reason to believe themselves free. They were declared free on the same bases that many other people had been declared free, and they lived in a community among people who had gone exactly the same path through the courthouse to freedom that they were encountering. For two years, it looked like they were free until the Missouri Supreme Court changed its composition and changed its direction based on an entirely new decision announced for the very first time in the Scots case. The Missouri Supreme Court decided to shift and in shifting they repudiated the 300 freedom cases that they had decided before. Instead of saying, Dred and Herod, you can be free and we'll change in the next case, this was the case that they chose to slam the door. Tensions were building in the nation. Kansas was becoming a hotbed of abolitionism. Missouri and St. Louis was increasingly realizing how the division between North and South that had long divided the North from the South along the East Coast was now extending to affect them. They got news on a far faster basis from Washington, D.C. They heard speeches being brought both by abolitionists in the North and pro-slavery advocates in the South, and the tensions were rising. So that the decision that was made in Dred and Harriet Scott's case, reversing at least 30 years of freedom suits before that was to conclude that a slave who had resided in free territory without actually getting their freedom papers there would be a slave again if they returned to slave territory as Missouri was. I'm going to say that again in shorter sentences. Sure. I think if I start turning to shorter sentences, you're going to have an easier time chopping this up and getting the sound bites. Dred and Harriet based their lawsuit on their residence in free territory. In this, they were doing nothing different than lots of slaves had done before them. And lots of slaves had won. What happened in Dred and Harriet's case is first their case was delayed and then the Missouri Supreme Court turned the tables on him. They changed the law, they reversed the basis, and they declared that Missouri was no longer going to recognize residents in free territory as a basis for emancipating or freeing a slave. After the Missouri Supreme Court decided that Missouri law was going to change, they still had one option and that option was to go to the United States Supreme Court. There are at least 15 contingencies between their losing at the Missouri Supreme Court and their getting a decision at the United States Supreme Court level. Any one of these 15 contingencies would have mooted the case. Dredd almost died, and if he would have died I think that the whole case would have collapsed. Mrs. Emerson had moved to Massachusetts. If she had been sued, her new husband would not have defended the suit. John F.A. Stanford, well, he died soon after the decision, and if he had died weeks earlier, that would have mooted the suit. And for a long time, it wasn't clear who was going to argue the case and how the case was going to be appealed. But once it was decided, let me start that again. <laughs>
Getting to the United States Supreme Court was a long shot for the Scots. It was a long shot because who was going to finance the suit? Who was going to litigate it? They had no money. They couldn't hire lawyers. And the Missouri statute did not provide for them to have lawyers to appeal their case to the United States Supreme Court. So there had to be volunteer lawyers, both on the side of helping the Scots and also on the side of defending against the Scots. When the case got to the Supreme Court, the nation was poised for considering this case. And the news of how it was going to come out was leaked almost two months before the decision was formal. The justices had lined up. After the Dred Scott decision, all legislative options had been eliminated. With the Dred Scott decision, Congress could not even engage in a process of gradual emancipation. Congress's hands were tied because the two times before that it had attempted to declare its territory to be free had now been declared unconstitutional. There couldn't be a political solution. There couldn't be a legislative compromise after the Dred Scott decision because the Supreme Court decision took away congressional power to enact things in order to eliminate slavery. Now, it could be said that the Dred Scott case was one of the causes of the Civil War. And from a legal basis, it's got to be understood as something that coupled with South Carolina's decision to secede from the Union. I'm not sure that the Dred Scott case itself would have caused the Civil War if South Carolina hadn't been primed to secede. They'd already won the Dred Scott decision. Their decision to secede was in part based on Northern reaction to Dred Scott. The North thought the Dred Scott decision was unconstitutional itself. But given the three bases on which the court had based its decision, there was no political future short of civil war. Part of the tension was shown even on the congressional floor in one of the worst cases of bad behavior ever on the congressional floor, after Charles Sumner had given a very impassioned speech against slavery, one of the Southern senators rose, took his cane, and beat him within an inch of his life. Charles Sumner was beaten on the floor of the Senate for making an anti-slavery speech as people rushed to his aid, he was removed to his chambers and to a hospital, and he was unable to return to the Senate floor for many months. One of the reasons that the tension was as inflamed as it was is that the South had declared it illegal to print anything of an abolitionist nature. Hence, when they saw newspaper articles that attacked slavery being printed in the North, they were unused to that same sort of rhetoric in their own midst because such language was illegal. It was illegal to speak anti-slavery matters in many states in the South, including Missouri. Before the Dred Scott decision, during the 11 years, Congress enacted a Fugitive Slave Act. And what the Fugitive Slave Act did really bothered the North. It essentially said that the South could reach into Northern Territory and take back slaves without necessarily having them brought before a Northern court. It went further. It said that northern courts had to enforce slavery 
And one of the cases that exploded was the Joshua Glover case in Milwaukee. The Joshua Glover case was a case in which a slave had run away from St. Louis, actually from the same guy who was managing the Scots. During the litigation, B.S. Garland was collecting the money for their earnings for John F. Sanford. Joshua Glover had run away from B.S. Garland. B.S. Garland tracked him down, found him in Milwaukee, tried to get the sheriff to deliver a writ, and the people of Milwaukee freed him from jail. They rioted, and they smuggled him out of the state. They put him on a boat and took him across the lake to Canada. B.S. Garland sued the people of Milwaukee, a printer in particular, a printer of a newspaper who had spread the news that B.S. Garland was in town and trying to get his runaway slave. And that lawsuit led to litigation that reached the Wisconsin Supreme Court. The Wisconsin Supreme Court didn't want to follow the Fugitive Slave Act either, and they did something later deemed to be unconstitutional. They decided they were not going to enforce the Fugitive Slave Act. You have similar things happening in Boston. Fugitive slaves are giving rise to riots in the streets. The people of Boston, the people of Milwaukee, are barricading the slaves in order to protect them from being returned to the South. And in the cause of things, the tensions are rising between the South and the North. Now, the Scots were not fugitive slaves, so that tension fed into their decision, the decision about their freedom, in a way that it overflowed the outrage that the North felt about needing to return fugitives and the feelings that the South had that the North wasn't playing by the rules of the Fugitive Slave Removal Act. So the tensions were pretty strong when Dred Scott was decided. The Fugitive Slave Act was in play. John Brown had been leading abolitionists to Kansas. Kansas was in an uproar. Um, what could be done? Tawney may have thought that he was quelling the waters by shutting the Scots out on all three bases. But there was no quelling of the waters. All it did was inflame the North even more. The Scots based their case on the residents in lands that were part of the Missouri Compromise and on lands that were part of the Old Northwest. Now these were two congressional enactments. The United States Supreme Court declared that Congress had acted unconstitutionally in passing those enactments. Consider the extent of that. The United States Supreme Court declared that the freedom provision under the Northwest Ordinance was unconstitutional. Hence, the Scots would have no basis to claim their freedom under that. The second basis was more procedural and more technical. In order to get a case into federal court, you had to be a citizen of a foreign nation or a citizen of one of the states. The United States Supreme Court unfortunately declared that the Scots as slaves were not citizens of any state. And although they were recognized as of African descent, they weren't recognized as citizens of an African nation either. So essentially, the procedural basis on which they lost was that they were citizens of nowhere. They had no home country. They had no citizenship.
The third basis on which the United States Supreme Court decided seemed to be more on the basis of ideology than law. And that basis was to declare in Chief Justice Taney's opinion that black men had no rights that white persons were deemed to respect. Black men, he said, had no rights that white men were obligated to respect. Now this is in contrast to 300 freedom suits where black people had been able to assert their rights even in Missouri courts. But Tawney's view was that there was something essentially different about people of African descent. And as a result of that, not only did Dred and Harriet Scott lose, their slavery be maintained, the secondary dimension of this was that no persons of color, free persons of color as well, were deemed to have any rights that white men were deemed to respect. So the three parts of the Dred Scott decision focused on the unconstitutionality of Congress doing something that had been recognized as constitutional for more than a half century, rested on the constitutionality of Congress and the Northwest Ordinance and its constitutionality. The second basis was the procedural basis of getting to court. The Scots were deemed to be without a country. They were citizens of no country, so they could not file suit. And the third basis was based on their color, their heritage. Being of African descent, the ruling was, they had no rights. Of course, the Dred Scott decision played differently in the North than it did in the South. But it also made Dred Scott the most famous black man in America. He was so famous that people actually traveled to St. Louis to get a look at him. People would write articles about traveling to St. Louis, not just to see the massive and majestic Mississippi River, but to see that black man, Dred Scott, whose case had split the nation. Dred seemed to take this in stride. He did the equivalent of signing autographs, which is that he took a job as a minor celebrity. And this job as a minor celebrity was in the hotel of Theron Barnum, who was a cousin of P.T. Barnum. It seems that P.T. Barnum had offered him a chance to go on the road and make even more money. But Harriet didn't like the idea. So she was interviewed in a national newspaper as saying that she just wanted Dred and herself and their daughters to return to a quiet life. Dred Scott's case legally had made political solutions impossible but Dred Scott's image had become the image of that individual who was denied his freedom, that individual who was treated poorly by the courts, that individual whose case the nation had lost. It would have been all too perfect if Harriet and Dred had been able to travel to Washington, D.C. to see their case argued. Such was not the case. They were pretty much overlooked in Missouri, where they lived at the time, until the decision was rendered. The person who was far more famous was John F.A. Sanford, because he was such a rich and influential man in the American Fur Company. So as between the two litigants, people would know John F.A. Sanford Nobody knew Dred and Harriet Scott. When the case was brought, though, it was brought by two lawyers, both of whom were national champions. The case was argued on one side by Reverdy Johnson, who had been the Attorney General of the United States previously, and on the other side by the Blairs, who had gotten
very influential both in Missouri and in Washington. The, the upshot of this was that of the four major actors, two attorneys and two litigants, the Scots were the least known. People knew John F.A. Sanford. They knew the name, they knew the association, they knew his wealth. People knew the two attorneys. They were Washington insiders. People didn't know Dred and Harriet Scott. They only knew their names. And in that, they only knew Dred's name. You know, the times were different then. And it was not a circumstance where people would come out and immediately respond to a decision. Instead, they might write privately in their journals. But the decision became part of the debates between Abraham Lincoln and his opponent. And the Dred Scott case itself became one of those things that was argued in presidential debates in which Abraham Lincoln was later elected. One of the journals that I read that struck me as most surprising is that the man who became Abraham Lincoln's attorney general, a fellow named Edward Bates, wrote in his journal that he thought that the Dred Scott deci decision was just right and that it would put an end to the arguments over slavery for time to come. Ironically, this man became Abraham Lincoln's attorney general. Wow. Dred and Harriet were some of the last slaves at Fort Snelling. But they weren't the last slaves because officers no longer needed domestic servants. They were the last slaves because of the influx of Irish immigrants into the United States. They were the last slaves because no longer was it cheaper to buy a slave in the St. Louis market. Now one could find an Irish servant. And all over the nation, Irish servants were replacing black servants in the North as the domestic servants of choice. African Americans who had long been in service, even as free African Americans, found themselves losing their jobs to Irish replacements as that became the new norm. Well, I think that the best answer to that is to say that Mrs. Dred Scott changed the genre. It wasn't the first book to change the genre, but for many years, I had a difficult time finding a publisher because the predominant view was that history was the province of the literate. So why write any kind of biography of somebody who was illiterate? There wouldn't be letters. There weren't letters. And it was, in fact, the ban on teaching African Americans to read that imposed part of the silence. It meant that we could never tell those stories. That the ice was broken on that with the cases involving Sally Hemings. We don't know how Sally Hemings felt about Thomas Jefferson. We only know a series of actions. And after it was declared probable that Sally Hemings' children were in fact descendants of the Jefferson family, it broke the ice. And the notion that African American lives were essentially part of the American fabric and could be the focus, even if they had never been able to write letters, became a new genre. So Mrs. Dred Scott, in fact, changed some of what we understand to be the genre of history, which is to take into account the best we can from circumstantial records, the lives that people who couldn't leave letters left for us.
Herod and Dred's daughters lived on. Dred only lived for about 18 months after the decision. He had tuberculosis and he'd almost died the year before. But when the decision was announced, it turned out that Mrs. Emerson had remarried and she'd remarried a Republican congressman from Massachusetts who was deeply embarrassed at discovering that having married the woman who actually owned Dredd, he now had owned the person who was the no most notorious black man in the United States. Quickly, Mrs. Emerson's new husband tried to figure out a legal way to free Harriet and Dredd, not so much to free them as to cleanse his own reputation. But you couldn't emancipate someone if you were not an in-state citizen. So there was no way that he could do it from either DC or from Massachusetts. He found a way by conveying Dredd and Harriet to somebody back in Missouri, Taylor Blow, who then as a Missourian was able to take out the papers. Harriet lived through the Civil War one of her daughters married and had children, and the children of those children still reside in St. Louis. Her other daughter never married and stayed with her mother, and they continued to be laundresses until well after the Civil War, well after the 13th Amendment, when slavery was finally abolished.